there's actually uh, an interesting intersection, and we were talking about this beforehand um, with what took place recently uh, in Jordan with the use of an Iranian-backed uh, militia, uh, use of, of a drone by an Iranian-backed militia to kill these uh, three U.S. soldiers. And in this case, what you see clearly in the reporting, and you can take a look at a Washington Post report uh, that I was just quoted in, a, a really good story that talks about the force protection measures or lack thereof, there was not really many active or passive force protection measures at this compound based upon a fairly reasonable threat assessment that led intelligence officials to believe that the most likely threats in terms of drones were going to be levied against larger scale compounds in Iraq and Syria. And so this particular compound in Jordan was more optimized for land-based threats. But had we thought that there were going to be Iranian drones thrown uh, at this location, you could conceivably use these lasers in addition to more classical or, or traditional what we call short range or SHORAD capabilities like a CWIS machine gun uh, or other sort of arresting nets. And so I think that there's real promise for these lasers that for the most part are being um, tested, fielded, experimented on, on the maritime domain in concert with maritime capabilities uh, ashore uh, for land-based platforms and expeditionary outposts like Tower 22 in Jordan. All right, so we see an immediate need for this, but it seems that the US, um, at least if you read this report, it appears as if uh, America is just waking up to the need for this. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? They seem to have been, these weapons seem to have been in, de in de development for quite a few years. Deployment on ships for trials uh, and exploratory trials would have begun, I believe, in sometime around 2014, 2015. But there seems to be a sense of urgency now. And are, is, are, you, are you saying that it is incidents like the attack on Tower 22 in Jordan, uh, lessons learned from the war in Ukraine, lessons here learned from the war in Gaza? Has this really jolted uh, the U.S. Congress into realizing that this is urgent? We need this now. Well, I certainly hope so, right? And there's a saying in operational art and design, which explains the conceptual tools that planners use to synchronize capabilities and time, space, and force to achieve objectives militarily that support political aims. There's a saying called, it goes slow until it goes fast, right? And so I think what you're seeing right now is one, an enduring understanding of the asymmetry that drones and other low cost systems can provide a smaller, uh, even non-state, especially non-state actor vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a larger military, right? There's been this enduring understanding, um, and we've known this for, for many decades, right? But what we're seeing right now is that the vulnerability imposed because of drones and low-cost systems at that, in terms of dead soldiers, given the deployments that the United States military and our allies and partners have abroad for global security purposes, really creates a key vulnerability. And so I think that it's important that Congress continue to spend money and indeed increase allocations and apportionments of money to experiment, test, and fill these capabilities. And so if you take a look at the history surrounding these lasers, there's a couple key themes that are quite troubling for me as an expert on emerging technologies and its implications for war. The first is the amount of money, again, notwithstanding this mammoth bill that we had with the Star Wars system during the Reagan uh, administration, the amount of money that we're spending on these lasers, solid state, dazzling, whatever they may be, is actually pennies compared to the broader DOD uh, budget, Department of Defense budget, which is in terms of the millions and billions and trillions, right? The second sort of consideration would be, whereas you would want continuity of development over time that gives you feedback from testing prototyping, especially uh, when used by soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, what you see in the literature and in this report we've referenced earlier is kind of a fits and start for capability development. So a contractor, Northrop Grumman, uh, Lockheed Martin, whatever, these large scale um, contractors put in a bid, uh, they get a contract, meaning they get you know money uh, to fill the capability uh, as well as profit. Uh, they, they produce a capability. It, it may be put into a ship for a little bit, but then it's extracted and it goes into uh, an ashore sort of assignment for further testing and calibra calibration of these uh, follow on lasers. And so, what we don't have right now is a real programmatic approach, as far as I can tell, 
to off um, or retrofitting rather our, our ships as they come out of production um, with this, um, this laser system. And, and that's kind of problematic. Uh, and the same thing is true, I believe, of what's happening in the land domain, where as we start to deploy these systems, um, we'll start to deploy these systems more in expeditionary environments because we know that they can be integrated and echeloned with existing systems as well to protect our soldiers.